Click start recording. You have. Great. I have now. We're live now. We are. We are. Now we just have to wait and see wow, if anybody showed up. Leo, Leo Mindel, of all the oh, people Oh, Leo Mindel, to see. how great. Well, Leo. Leo, you've definitely seen the, the Work M London talk on your experiment yeah. because you were recording it, isn't it? <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> this is a lovely turnout. Guy from Tenerife. Is Guy the guy that you were going to introduce me to, Peacha, from Tenerife? No, no, because oh. the guy from Tenerife is called Nando. Okay, fair enough. Right. So um, not, not hello. Guy. Hello, hello. This is great. It's so lovely to see so many people giving up a portion of their Tuesday. He said, glancing at the top right-hand corner of his screen, not knowing actually what day it was. Um, <laughs> yeah, really, I appreciate it. I always say this, and I always, I always feel that I, I sound insincere, but I'm trying not to be. I am honestly saying thank you very much for making the effort. To so am I. Down. Yeah, yeah, so really. So am I. Thank, thank you very, very much. I have no idea because I can't see who's there, but I, whoever is there, I am deeply grateful that you're here. Well, and we'll do our best to entertain you. Currently about 20 of us, uh, so we'll see how yeah. that goes. So, yeah, if you – I'll just quickly show you around the webinar platform in case anything goes wrong because it's – obviously, it's browser-based, and that can be significant. First thing is, if, for example, the audio freezes or the video freezes, please just click Refresh on your browser. That tends to solve all the problems. Uh, you'll hop back in. The only thing is you've all got a unique uh, URL. So if somehow you manage to alter that URL, you'll be in a bit of bother. So maybe just make sure that you click Refresh and don't amend the URL in any way. Uh, the other thing is there is a the chat box where you're all typing in where you're from. That's very kind. Um, so you'll notice at the top of that box, hopefully you've got a section marked chat, which you're currently engaging with. And next to that is something called Q&A. Now, the idea here is that if you, if you just want to have a chat, then brilliant, put it in the chat section. But if you've got an actual question, you know, with a question mark at the end, then uh, stick it in the Q and A section, and then you know I can uh, I can get those questions to Peacher um, at the very end. Right. Without further ado, then I'm just going to. Uh, well, I'm going to come back to me in a minute. But first of all, I want to make sure that I say hello to Peacher. Hi there. Hello, Nathan. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Peacher is currently in a really in a kind of a place where I want to be. Uh, when this call is finished, she's going to go and do something really groovy, which I want to do. We don't have to go into that, but where you are is, oh, <laughs> here I am in the north of England, cold and wet, and you are in yeah. Italy. Yeah, very nice. Yes. Um, yes, I am. My name's Nathan Wrigley. I come from WP Builds, which is a WordPress podcast. We put out episodes every Thursday, and we do a news episode every Monday. We do things like this. So if you go to wpbuilds.com and use the menu at the top, uh, find the subscribe link and you can join us if you are into WordPressy things. But it's not about me today, so that's my pitch over. I'm going to hand over to Peacher. Uh, Peacher, we discussed earlier about us switching off our uh, cameras. So first of all, do you want to do you want to just launch your slides? Because Peacher's Let's clearly here to talk that. to us about U UX for everyone. Yes, I am indeed. So let's do it. Okay, I'll wait till your slides are on before I turn off my camera, just in case some gremlin occurs. Right, great. So I'm gonna. There you go. No gremlin. Switch off my camera, and I should now be gone. Could you guys just, for the benefit of us, so that we know that we're not talking to a dead, uh, you know, an audience mm -hmm. that can't see anything? Can you see Peach's uh, slide that says "UX for Everyone"? Because I can. Uh, we see the slide. Yes, 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 yes. Lots of yeses. Yes. Okay. Brilliant. I think, that's I think what it's we safe like. to say like. that that's working. Yeses. Okay. Great. great Peter, I'm going to hand over to you. Please, as I say, Q&A, put them in the Q&A box. That's great. Yes. So my name is Peter Neri. I'm Italian, uh, currently in Siena, Italy. But I have lived, I used to live in London where I was for like 20 years uh, uh, working as a designer in various capacities. And now I live in Valencia, Spain, because it's much sunnier there. <laughs> so I used to be a designer for print and then I moved to the web a few years ago. And that sort of completely changed everything for me because I, even though the design principles are the same, but the way you approach projects is really, 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 really different. And I 
found it quite difficult, funnily enough, to design for the web. But Nathan, you probably never had that I, because you're a developer. So for you, it's like it always was about screens. But for me, yeah, it wasn't. So no, this is an area that I've managed to stay away from until I have to do it and realize how utterly, utterly hopeless I am. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, um, well. UI, which means user interface, which means design, is different from UX. The thing is that I think that you do a little bit of UX as well. However, let's start from the beginning. Let's not, I, I tend to digress. So please slap me on the wrist whenever I digress too much. Um, so uh, basically, I sort of realized that I needed to rework my approach to design and to how to tackle a project as a whole, and I realized that it really, really started from UX. But the thing is that UX in general is, is almost scary a little bit because my experience was, my first sort of encounter with UX was when I was working at the uh, British Film Institute where I was directing the design department there and I was um, collaborating with the web team and they were doing it like a huge web, web project. I mean. That, that you know, that for a very big big institution such as the BFI, your website is an ongoing process, basically never ends. But that's when I worked with a big UX team. And of course, in a big team, there's loads of different UX profiles of, of a you know professional. So there's a researcher, there's a designer, there's lots of different people. So that's what is, is, is scary. So, you know, as a team of one, you think, can I do it? And the answer is yes. So this UX for everyone thing that I keep talking about is actually my take on how to adapt the UX process to small people like you and me or team. Well, I don't know. That's an assumption that you are small. I don't know. But this is interesting for people who have either a small team or even a team of one or a team of two. So if you have a big, huge, you know, company and or, or you're interested in learning how to be a UX pro, this is not quite what I'm talking about here. But I, so it's two things is what is UX, how it can help us and how you can do it just as a, as a team of one and how I am so deeply convinced because it was re revolutionary for me to understand what it can do. It's actually a business frame of mind, really, and it overlaps with lots of other processes that we do. But anyway, let's go into it. Okay. So UX for everyone. Yes, let's get started. So first of all, and let's see if this works. Yes, it does. What is UX, which may seem like a bit of a silly question, but the thing is, in my experience, no question is too obvious, not even this one. Well, with UX, Don Norman, who uh, you may or may not know who he is, he Don Norman was, he's like the granddaddy of, of UX. He was at Apple in the 90s and he created the first UX roles and he was himself user experience architect. So fun, which is what UX is, by the way. UX stands for user experience. And by the way, Don Norman now hates Apple, which is another funny <laughs> story. Because I kind of do as well. My sister used to call me the Mac Taliban. And now <laughs> I'm not anymore because I don't think they're doing UX the way that they are, which is what Don Norman it actually says. But let's not, that's, this is a typical digression. <laughs> so I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. But anyway, I think we, we all know, you know, we're, we've ascertained that we all know what those two letters stand for. And that's user experience. Because if you think about it, it's actually fairly obvious, isn't it? What is a website or indeed anything without user experience? You know, simply put, it doesn't exist. No experience, no website, no app, no. Because also one thing that I'd like to say is that I'm sort of saying website to simplify, but this kind of applies to, if not any product, most products of any kind. Obviously, here we're talking about digital products, but it doesn't necessarily need to be a website. It can be an app or, you know, anything else. But um, so whether you have thought about it or not, your website or your app or whatever will give your users an experience. You just can't avoid it. You know, it's, it's, it's inevitable. So uh, the difference is that if you've thought about it and planned your user's experience, you're first of all likely to control it and then you're very highly likely to give the humans that come to your site 
a better experience and above all the experience that they want to have which is mm -hmm. an important specification because not what you want them to <laughs> experience but rather what they want to experience so as i was saying earlier as small agencies as freelancers we we, we worry about this we think well how can i do that it's just i don't have a big budget i don't have a big team team and you know i'm, I'm overwhelmed by this but like i said the process can and really should be adapted to serve anyone. And if you haven't tested it yet and you're asking yourself whether you, UX can help us small people well, and whether you can do it on a small budget and without a team, well, simply put, the answer is just yes. So I think this is clarified. Um, mm -hmm. So basically my point and something that I really insist on is that good UX is good design and it is also good marketing because some of the techniques, in fact, overlap. And even someone like you, Nathan, he's pointing <laughs> at you. Like as I was saying earlier, you do it. Because anytime you ask a client a question, you are doing a, you know, a version of, of UX. So, yeah, um, but yeah, absolutely. But there are things that marketing alone doesn't do or that, you know, development questions don't do. And that's where, you know, design steps in. So it's important to work out how we assess UX. And there are three essential components that are at the basis of a user's experience of a product. Let's, let's call it product, website, app, whatever. I'm going to call it product because it's kind of okay. uh, more appropriate, actually. So, and these are the look, the feel, and the usability. First of all, the look, because visual experience is essential to ex establishing understanding as well as uh, credibility and trust. I'm just going to open a, um, a, an aside here saying that, of course, if you're visually impaired, there are other ways to experience the site, and that's about accessibility, which is also about good UX. Then the feel, not uh, meaning with feel is how how does it make you feel is it a joy is it easy to use this product and interact with it and then also the usability oh i've gone too far sorry uh That's the usability okay. no, it's fine. Uh, uh, as we said it's not live if there is if there isn't a slight mess up so this was probably yeah. the first <laughs> it's definitely exactly live. so you exactly definitely live. so usability is about how functional and predictable and easy to use the product is so the happy balance of these three elements is achieved via a process that has empathy at its core. This is the crucial in ingredient of UX, and I'm never going to say it often enough, really. So putting yourself in your user's shoes and actually walking a few miles in them by their side is what we're talking about. So reminding ourselves that users, which is a really sort of dry and often almost inappropriate term, we just use it because it's convenient, but really that it's humans behind the screen. Uh, humans that are looking for a solution to their problem, and they're not just a number in our Google Analytics stats. And mm -hmm. another important point to make about empathy is that really we often overestimate how much we can empathize because naturally we project our own experiences onto other people's, and which can lead to mistaken empathy. So we must remember that we, no one can know exactly how someone else feels. Even, even if there are your twin, you know, your twin, it's really quite hard. So sometimes we mean well, but we don't, you know, really, we must remember that we can't know for sure how someone else feels. So for instance, you don't know what it's like <laughs> to be <laughs> heavily pregnant unless we have been. And even so, you may have a different experience because there's some women that have a you know, very easy pregnancy and others don't. But until what you can do you, is you can wear the pregnancy belly, which is, you know, this is a real thing. Uh, this is, you know, wow. happens. And like, you, <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, I think this photo is, uh, this is um, US soldiers uh, being, being made to empathize with, with heavily pregnant women. But all, yeah. and one thing that we could do when designing for the web is, is you know, you could wear a, a blindfold when using the web or you could unplug your mouse or you could deactivate your trackpad but even using a computer with a big belly is actually problematic because you can't reach so there's all sorts of things to consider the 
the most important thing is to make sure that you listen, you accept the difference and that you walk together. Because this type of empathy doesn't just improve UX, it also improves accessibility. And actually, if you think about it, there's a big business case for accessibility, which is that you don't leave money on the table, excluding uh, people that if you make sure that everybody can use your website. So there's, there are so many business cases for all this. Hmm. So if someone sees all shades of green, and even here, I'm assuming that you see green the way I do, because someone else might not, but this is what I see right now because it's a simulation of a color blindness, uh, form of, of a form of color blindness. So if someone sees green where you see red, orange, and yellow, you have to accept that your vision is not the absolute truth and their truth is as valid as yours and this is something that we must take into account. So mm. the best empathy for UX, yeah, I think this is so important and I don't know how often we do it, but it's really important. So. The best empathy is informed as well as accepting that other people's truth is as valid as yours, even when our personal experience is, is different. And there are two talks that I want to mention at this point. One is by Morton Rand Hendrickson, who's uh, he's a Linda teacher and, you know, overall awesome human being who gave a talk at WordCamp Europe 2016 in Vienna about empathy. And also another one is by Eric A. Meyer. And I can't remember exactly the year, but I think it was WordCamp US. And I can, I can give the links later, but there are brilliant talks about empathy and how it is absolutely at the basis of UX. And I'm going to give you ex the, what is for me the absolute best example here. And I'm, I'm sorry, it's a bit fuzzy, the image, because it's sort of the PDF, it's how it's saved. But this is informed empathy that accepts other people's truth and experience and it's what happens when you truly put the human beings that you're designing for at the very center of your process it's a wonderful little tale of love in a hospital in bilbao in spain they substituted scary gurneys with toy cars for kids that need to be taken to the operating theater so oh. by uh, isn't that the sweetest thing you've ever seen yeah. Actually, this is not the sweetest there's an even few even sweeter photos but it's so touching because yeah. instead of it being absolutely terrifying they actually have fun and you can see the faces of these kids just you know having fun and feeling like instead of dread there's a slight sort of feeling of fun and anticipation so isn't that i think it's just it's just wonderful so mm -hmm. you know this is 10 out of 10 in all three criteria because it looks and it feels great and it's also functional and it's easy to use and it's a hundred percent thinking about the users because i'm sure it's easier for the surgeons to use a gurney yeah. or for the you know for the for the for the nurses but it's not for the kids and it's just it makes me oh it makes me so happy mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so this is what we should strive for you know it's a great lesson in empathy and really the level of em empathy that we should strive for but when it comes to websites how do we measure empathy how do we tell if we've done a good job with our with our website so we can let's have a let's reverse engineer the look feel and usability criteria and look at a way of assessing empathic ux on the web via three simple questions and those questions are, does the site or application, and I should just call it product, give the user value? Does the user find the product simple to use and navigate? And does the user actually enjoy using the product? And we're going to uh, have a look at two different websites that are actually language websites. So this was for, uh, the this original talk was for WordCamp London, where you're not really allowed to mention anyone but if you want to have a look for yourselves i think we're fine here aren't we i can say what website this is you can Nath, i can mm -hmm. this is uh duolingo which is a language learning uh software mm -hmm. and to me it's 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 a brilliant website because it, it gives an incredibly clear experience with a brilliantly simple heading one that leaves no doubt as to what you get from the experience here learn a language for free forever that's yeah. it and it's and also that you know the imagery is very simple, but it's evocative and it's quite inspirational, isn't it? I mean, it's mm. the world seen from space. It's nice. I mean, yeah, you can think you're an astronaut even, but you know, <laughs> and also 
you, you can just go for the get started button if you want but if you don't if you just you know if you're someone a little bit more inquisitive you can go and and look at the um languages bar at the bottom which i think is great and then if you do that this is literally what happens if you click on anything then you get to this page well no if you look up, click on get started if you click on yep. one specific language obviously something different happens but so before you know it you're uh, you know you can say okay well let's uh i want to learn i want to learn what is this uh i think I, I chose a really weird language but i can't remember which one it is i think it might be norwegian because i was about oh, to go to yeah, none, of that looks, none of that looks familiar to me <laughs> no but this is literally what happened so i clicked let's say i'm going to go back click on get started decide i want to learn norwegian or japanese or whatever i clicked on i can't remember um and then your third screen you're learning wow that's it so yeah. you find yourself actually learning a language without even having to set up a profile or give them your email it's just it's extraordinary so the designers really put themselves in the position of the visitor whose burning desire is to learn a new language without spending a lot of money and the journey could not be easier and mm. then so uh and, and then once you get to the dashboard you haven't yet had to give them your, your email so if you like the experience you create a profile and you give them your email otherwise you just don't which i hey. think is amazing it's, yeah isn't, it's isn't really that, clever yeah it's yeah. really upside down model yeah absolutely and i think it's a, it's a big lesson it made me think a lot so the three answers to the benchmarks that i will remind you is like yes it gives me value as a user that was the first question because i'm afraid to offered to learn uh, a language in exchange of nothing not even an email address so then the second question was is it easy to, to use and navigate absolutely yes and do i enjoy it yes i absolutely do mm. then yeah so this is you know it's just it's a it's a great example then there's another language learning website and this one is rosetta stone and uh the experience is a little bit different because the thing is i have used when i was um well a few years ago i was just learning languages as as in my spare time mm -hmm. <laughs> which is you know everyone to each, each their own really yeah so yep. i've used rosetta stone and the software is really good but i find the the website no one near as smooth as the duolingo website because the home page does make it clear that you can learn a language here but i find it confusing because the, the images are really generic there's a woman woman laughing doesn't necessarily have to do with languages which i understand sometimes i use you know sort of what i call evocative images so okay fine but but what i don't understand is actually the what they say because it says learn the language not just the words which actually takes a bit of an intellectual effort for me to understand what they mean i don't immediately guess it and um so yeah, I find I find that confusing. It may just be me, but I don't know. Uh, and then, in the second place, it's impossible, impossible to get a demo without providing an email address. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also, it's not even clear whether the, the, the demo is then interactive on the website or whether you get sent it. But so the first answer is no. It doesn't give me the same value as a user. And then the second answer, whether it's difficult to use, it's a bit like ah. Uh, because it's not particularly difficult unless you consider as a benchmark for that how easy it is to get a demo because in that case it's a no it's not easy to get a demo because mm. i don't know yet that what what is this going to do is it going to give me a login via email or i don't know is it is it going to ask me to download software it's really not, yeah, not it's, yeah it's not 100 percent clear i guess you get something no. via email but or maybe it's the next screen i'm not entirely sure yeah no I, i'm not either and I, I couldn't be bothered with it too too so then i tried <laughs> no i just couldn't because i was just coming for that and then i tried a different journey to get to the demo hoping it might be online interactive because i've always been a sucker for in, interactive courses i just love it i would you know that's why i love i loved uh treehouse you know yes, learning yeah, coding just le yeah. just to do interactive tests i just i'm a sucker for that. so um but it's not look if i if i try another journey another way to get here to get to the free demo he wants my money he wants my money already okay. so uh, without even having tried so i don't care how good the software is i would go back to geolingo because it gives me much more value and i enjoy it so much more and it's much easier to use 
So then I guess that with Duolingo, I would probably try it at least a couple of months, maybe give them a little bit of money and then decide. And But then I would be like, oh, I'm happy I gave you some money because you gave me such a good time, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so be, you know, in short, be like but website one, aka Duolingo, make your users happy and don't be like website two. So don't be like Rosetta Stone. So you ask for money immediately, which makes me laugh because I probably do ask for money. But yes, there I think, you go. It's, the, I think I it's the normal <laughs> way of doing things, isn't it? But I can see if you make a direct comparison between one and two, there is a clear winner on that point and that point alone, even though it's not the typical way of doing it. Yeah, good point. Absolutely. It is a good point. It is also true that I've given you examples of websites that have billions behind them, you know, yeah. huge yeah. teams, and they probably what looks like incredibly simple in the case of the Duolingo, Duolingo website probably took so long. And actually, I know the Duolingo team, they're very interesting and they, you know, it's a lot of people involved and a lot of user testing and, and so on. Mm. So anyway, back to the uh, back to the process. Uh, let's see how we can achieve something similar to website one. But because there's a design methodology website one being Duolingo, I remind you. There's a design methodology that's called design thinking that can greatly help us with that, with achieving good results with UX. And in fact, the UX process and, and the design thinking process have a lot in common. Simply put, they're both user-centric processes, processes. So being user-centric can be a big mentality shift to make for small business owners who often make design decisions based on personal taste. How often has it happened to us that a, a, a client says, oh, you know, no, can you make that red? You know, it's a typical thing or make the logo bigger. There's other, or, well, I don't like that. That's so mm. typical. So mm -hmm. that's why I also find that it's important to be able to give clients a reason why, always a reason behind uh, the choices rather than just a matter of personal taste. So we must make our clients change their attitude and be more user-centric. User because when you use design thinking, you make decisions based on what customers really need and not on your own or your client's preference. So I'm going to show you what I mean by this by looking at a real life situation that happened to me when a prospect, not even a client yet, came to me and said, we need to improve our traffic this month by, you know, a third, which okay. feels like a, you know, something they sort of throw there anyway. And they wanted to do this by buying Google and Facebook ads. So the normal approach would be to go, okay, fine, let's have a look at, well, maybe we could buy blog posts. You could create blog posts and then send traffic to them via Google ads. But in fact, the design thinking and UX approach starts with asking why instead. And you really need to ask why as many times as necessary. If anyone uh, who's listening has been through the WP Elevation program, which you have, Nathan. Mm, yeah, yeah, I know where you're going with this, yeah. Exactly, the go wide, the so-called go wide, go deep technique that Troy Dean teaches is basically just ask why, 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 go deeper and then wider and you know go wide first and then go deep because you always unearth things that the client didn't even realize were an issue before. So um, in, in this case, uh, and, and then sometimes it, you, you ask why so many times that it makes you a little bit uncomfortable and you should really keep asking until you do feel uncomfortable. That's when you stop, but you do ask it until that last why when it's like, Ugh, because that's you know <laughs> where it means that you have asked enough times. So in the case of this client, the final answer to the question, why do you need an increase in traffic, was that they were not getting as many sales as usual. So the real answer is, why aren't the current users converting? Because I had a look at, the, at the, the, their um, uh, analytics and they weren't bad at all. They were getting quite a, you know, a healthy number of visits. So the solution is not Google Ads, because the solution clearly is not traffic. So once I... Um, uh, looked uh, at the website, you know, at the analytics that were saying that the, the problem re ended up being that there was nothing to do for the users when they actually landed on the site because that's where they found. I mean, I've hidden all the logos, so it actually mm. looked a little bit more engaging with the logos. But however, this was it. And if you read their that lovely quote, which means nothing, 
What yes. is this? Would you know, would you know where this is? I, mean, I have I literally no idea what to do next. No, you're quite right. <laughs> or what would would you know what they're selling? Um, no, I'm looking at the menus desperately to yeah. find out, and I can't also, even read them because it's white on a light so, background. So yes, no, and it's really know. tiny as yeah. well. Where yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. So so many things. So obviously the, that that was not you know Google Ads were not what was needed here. So. Uh, the need was in traffic. It was on page uh, optimization, really. And without the initial why question, you would have just, you know, it would have been easy to say, yeah, okay, let's do Google ads or Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I, I, I ran a short survey with one of the existing clients that confirmed the initial analysis and which was that there was nothing for them to do once they got to the website. And also even finding a contact form took really hard work. So by putting the why question first and then, asking the users I got to the real problem and this is what design thinking is all about now I want to say something else that again proves that this is live <laughs> um, Nathan, Nathan we decided to go for the PDF because it was just uh, easier yes and, and safer but then of course I forgot that some of the slides had a build um, oh. So, oh no no that's not yeah, we yeah, it, but it's it, fine, yeah. With, a, with a flat PDF, we're stuck without the animated bits and pieces, I'm afraid. We're stuck, but we have very clever viewers who don't need the animation. Yeah, we can well describe understand. it. We oh, can yes, describe. I see. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. You think, for instance, <laughs> I, I, would, I was going to go through the items one by one, and, and uh, before it wasn't just us. Anyway, I was going to go through the items one by one, and the, and the arrows would animate, but I think it's fine. So I gave them a short... Uh, solution without a, a you know short-term solution uh with a very quick turnaround with no need for a redesign which was you know change the headline and explain what the business was because it helps and um adding an immediately visible find out more button and a testimonial for credibility because they th these are really brilliant uh it's tour operators they they uh, they get incredible reviews so they should you know be prominent um, and then also social sharing buttons because we didn't have those. So there's not anything that, you know, strictly speaking is a conversion in marketing speech but because find out more doesn't convert to anything, but at least there is something for the user to do. So the experience is immediately improved, even with right. very little done right. because you put the user at the center before, you know, the, the user, the, the clients were like, the owners were like, yeah, we love that photo because it was such a happy day and we loved the quote. It's like, yeah, but it's not helping your users, is it? So this made things better for the time being, but I knew that much more thinking would be needed for the for the longer term. However, this is a fairly typical situation for a lot of us because you're a small business, business client with an old website that needs a uh, lot of work, who's never really thought of asking their audience what they really want, or even using their website as a marketing tool because these people were using the website as their uh, brochure and yeah. there's their booking system they would send they had a you know really complex gravity forms that they use to get people to sign up and to pay but that's what they were using the website for so using um a version of the design thinking process to help them find a solution can prove very effective as well as provide answers to problems they didn't even know they had yet because mm -hmm. they were like oh that's so amazing so Back to the design thinking process, it has five phases. And again, there was an animation here, but you can oh, imagine it. <laughs> oh, no, 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 it's absolutely fine. It's, it's a, basically, it's a non-linear uh, uh, process. So the, the first process, the first uh, phase is to empathize with the user, users, which is instrumental in to defining the problem, which is the second phase. And then once you've defined the problem, you ideate the solution then you prototype it and then you test it. And the uh, the the uh, sort of curved arrows mean that, you know, from the test, sometimes you have to go back to the empathy or back to the ideation or to the definition or from the prototype to the ideation and so on. This is just to say that it's not a linear process. And actually, you know, the design process in general is never linear. It's just messy in real life. It's not, you can't follow. This is a guideline and a structure that helps 
hugely. And but the most important thing is that it starts with with empathy. So when I found myself, you know, studying all these things, learning about them, and trying to work out a system for myself, I sort of distilled the five faces of the UX of the design thinking process into three phases of a the UX of a sort of abbreviated what I called an abbreviated UX process. Yeah, so yeah. the research phase, the research phase first, then the design phase, and then the, the validation, which is then followed by the optimization, which happens when you're you've already launched. So for me, the research takes up 50 or even 60. There's there's no it's not like you stop at 50 or 60 percent of the time. You just do as much as research as you need to, because as Paul Lacey completely agrees with me with, and um, many of you probably know Paul Lacey, Nathan, you certainly do. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we had a lot of great conversations about UX, and he's now swears by it, and he's a you know recent adopter, and he says that the research process, when it's well done, it actually makes the design phase so much quicker. So then the validation, which is really the testing, is never ending. It never really stops. So you just call it, you validate before you launch, and then after you launch, you, you, it's called optimization. But basically, it's just going back and forth and back and forth. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, so you just keep testing. And that's the important thing. But I'll, I'll touch on this point later on as well. So I, let's not digress. Okay. So this is how, if you remember the five phase, phases that I mentioned before, this is how they, they integrate into the UX uh, process. So empathize and define in the design thinking process become research in the UX process. Ideate and prototype become the design, pro, the design part of the UX process. And test is the same thing as, as validation. So just yeah. two different yeah. ways of calling the same thing. So... Getting started with phase one, which is research, like I said. One really important thing to consider is that when we talk about users, you we always seem to think that it's the people at the other end, the people that the, the clients, so to speak, the customers who interact with the website. But the thing is that also the business owners and even their employees actually are human beings that use the use the products mm. that we create so that's really important um so um the central part of of the research phase which we must bear in mind is the empathy phase and just i remind you empathy the little kids going to the operating the theater in the in the toy cars mm. so you need to talk to, to the stakeholders and to the users and you need to ask them as many questions as possible in order to find out as much as you can about the business and about the market. And we normally do it with, with uh, interviews. And um, there are many ways to carry out the interviews. And this is where it, it sort of goes into quite a bit of detail, but you, you can ask the questions uh, via questionnaires or you can do workshops because there are also uh, we know plenty of clients who don't like to fill in forms and they want you to do it for them. So you just do it with them with, uh, uh, with, a, with a workshop. So uh, usually when you start asking lots of, lots of questions, you unearth truths and issues about the business. They will inform the design. It just happens all the time. It can be even things like that um, the business the the partner of the business owner you know the business partner of uh, one of the owners has a uh, life partner that works in the business and that creates friction these are all things that come up and they really really do inform the design in the end so like i said earlier usually the stakeholders i'm still talking about the business side okay. the stakeholders are the decision makers and you do need to have the decision makers in the room. Also, Nathan, as you well know, that's something else that WP yeah. Elevation insists yeah. a lot on. Yeah. And for those who don't know, WP Elevation is basically a business course for uh, WordPress uh, agency owners, basically. So, uh, but you need to really make sure that you ask questions also to any employees 
that may hold significant insights or that are going to use a website or app every day of their life. And I promise you that I've seen big projects fail because the employees were not uh, were not consulted. Because I, okay. yeah, yeah. At the BFI, for instance, where I was, they, there was a big rebrand that was done without ever consulting any of the employees on the brand. And that's, yeah, it, it was, mm. and it, you know, there were, it, the BFI, the British Film Institute, for those who don't know, is in London. It's one of those institutions that uh, it's a brand that people feel a lot of emotional attachment to, and especially mm. the people who work for it. It's like a, it's like a, a calling to work at the BFI sometimes. Yeah. So it really created a lot of problems. And um, so you, you just mustn't forget employees, basically. And of course, then the other part of the research phase is the research on the users. And it's where you, we get to the user personas, which you probably have heard about, which are yep. the he ideal human being that you want to serve. Mm -hmm. And which is another... I, I always remind people that user mean human being because otherwise it's easy to dehumanize when we are online too much. So sometimes with a small business or a startup, it may be that they truly have no users yet or that they find it difficult to consult them. I think it's often it's a problem that comes up. So there are there are simple ways around it, this because in a small business, a business business owner is usually a user. Um, that created the business out of their need or passion. Like, for instance, the travel, the, uh, travel agency on the Camino de Santiago in Spain that I showed mm -hmm. you earlier, that the owners were simply uh, pilgrims first and then became guides that then decided to start up, to up their own business. So they're also nice. their own. Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing, it's such a great, makes me want to go so much. So first of all, ask the owners themselves because especially if the business has been running for a while or even not, they, they, they know they still, they know what their uh, clients want sometimes. So user personas to go back to, to this are a, a distilled representation of the ideal human being that you want to serve with your products and with your services. Again, if you get stuck, you can ask, you can use acquaintances and friends. Like for instance, when I was creating the user personas for the, for this uh, travel agency, I asked uh, on Facebook, and of course, out of the woodwork come uh, lots of friends who would love to go into Camino de Santiago and are actually in the target audience, even as a demographic. Mm. So that's how I found out. But you also you can run surveys. You could, if you have the budget, you can run Facebook ads, or you can uh, get a bunch of users in a Zoom room and do a workshop. There are many, many, many ways, and it's much easier than you think. So. Once you have the user personas, which we'll see how you do, um, you invariably get to the definition of their problem. And there's quite a bit that you need to know in order to create the user personas. They're not like, you know, automatically created just by thinking, okay, I want pilgrim is on the way to uh, Santiago. You need, first of all, to look at the demographics, so the, the who, so their age, their gender, their occupation, their geolocation, their income, but but they're not as important as the psychographics, which is the why. And our friend Dave Foy definitely agrees with me on this, mm -hmm. and also something, yeah. Um, so he goes on it a lot, and I've learned a lot from him about this. So the psychographics, which is the why, is like the burning problem, the emotions driving it, and the desired successful outcome which is often much more important than their age or where they come from, than their needs, which is what do they need to solve their challenges and get to the desired outcome, than the solution. What will we provide in order to meet their needs? And then also give them a name because whatever you do for the business, you keep doing it with that person in mind. Okay. Now, I want to say that in terms of slides UI, what I always recommend whenever it, you have bullet points is to run them one by one because otherwise people know already what's on the page and it's just wrong for the narrative. But that's another build. That we're, <laughs> we're live. <laughs> <laughs> we're live. So, yeah, there you go. 
So uh, in the case of this boutique, boutique travel agency, this is what the ideal customer avatar came out being, being. And I built it by interviewing the business owners a lot and then by asking questions to a handful of past clients who had been on the trip that we were, were promoting. And I also um, found various uh, avatars on, the, on, on Facebook groups. So the who turned out to be, I, I called it Sharon, and she's 55 plus, she's North American, retired, good income, time on, time on her hands, like the outdoors, healthy, but not super fit. The why is what really matters because she and her husband have this burning desire to complete the Camino de Santiago, which is a spiritual pilgrimage in Spain, which is strictly speaking Catholic, but not just. Anybody mm -hmm. can do it. It's much more of a sort of generically spiritual journey because you're walking it, basically. So that's what makes it very, very special. And it was to fulfill a promise made to a relative who passed away. And this is all based on real people, by the way. So it's not made up. And their fears are that they're not sure if they're fit enough and they're worried that they might need to speak Spanish to get by. They're not sure if they left it too late and so on. And the, but they also need, like to be comfortable and they want to rough it out on route. So the solution is that we know that we're the best agency for Sharon because we have the perfect solution to her needs, but she's not aware of it. We need to make sure that she is, uh, that she is aware of it, of it. So this is what we get to in the research phase okay this is what we've done by using the empathy and and so on mm -hmm. and this brings us to the end of the research phase so usually once you have all this information you can you will get you know with the interviews from the business side and the user personas and so on you can because also let's not forget that user persona can be also on the on the client side on the actual business side so this uh, gets you to have a site map user persona and then you can define the needs and you can start thinking of a solution. So now we move into the design phase, which is, please note, when I say design here, I mean planning, I do not mean styling, because not yet, we're in the problem solving phase and the style and the UI, so the user interface phase, phase m comes much after the UX phase. Okay, the proper UX phase. Although, although, da -da, I am going to con contradict myself completely <laughs> because it's very true that the UI phase comes after, but mostly true in the case of a very big project with a large budget and a large team, and even not if you're using UX uh, project managing methodologies like such as Agile, you wouldn't do this anyway, because in the case of the UX process for us anyway, smaller people, it, the lines are blurred, you, blurred, you know, you just find yourself um, working on UX and UI at the same time, and it's absolutely okay because sometimes you build a style prototype, but sometimes if you use Beaver Builder or, Ele or Elemental, you can just go live with it, with yeah. it, and actually test on real users, which is actually it's not skipping a phase; it's condensing it. It's more practical, and I prefer it. It's actually better. So, just to remind ourselves about the process, um, design phase. Uh, leads us to the sitemap, which then leads us to the wireframes. Now, in, in uh, um, as a real life demonstration of what I just said, so that the UX and the UI process get mixed up in real life when we deal with smaller projects, is that we, we needed, you know, back to the, the, the travel agency, the I you know, skipped the wireframes phase and I went straight into rebuilding the website because it was built with a with visual composer, I'll have you know. <laughs> Good luck. Shudder, shudder. It was impossible mm -hmm. to redesign anything. So uh, there was budget for a rebuild, but not for a complete redesign. So I rebuilt, but of course, I also rejigged the design using all the information that I gathered. If you think about putting yourself in Sharon's hiking boots, this is... If, you know, if Sharon were on the trail, she would be looking at the people ahead of us exactly in this way. And, you know, this photo really makes you feel like you're in this sort of wonderful forest walking towards the Camino mm. the, the Santiago. So uh, let's not, you know, it's too much to go into detail, but this is now centered on Sharon. However, when Sharon lands on the website, we know that she's often not ready to buy or not even get a discount voucher, however big and orange you make that button. So, <laughs> you know, and actually the button isn't, 
isn't even there anymore because it wasn't really converting. So, you, but you don't know unless you try. Until you try, that's the whole yeah, point. You don't yeah. know until you try. So, we need to reassure Sharon further, and we need to draw her in. What? So I thought, well, what can I do to do that? And I thought, ah, a funnel with a quiz. A funnel with a quiz because nice. who can? Yeah, who can resist the quiz? So within the quiz, we can use the copy to answer her questions and reassure the, the fears, her fears. So what did I have to do? As soon as I thought I need to do a funnel with a quiz, I thought, ah, what do I need to do first? Da -da -da. First thing to do is a funnel map because even if it seems like, okay, well, that's going to be simple. It's not, not ever. You need to sit down and the first step towards clarifying how we lead the, her by the hand is to, is to, um, is to do it via, you know, map her journey out. So it seems obvious, but this is UX. So if you've done it, if you have done a the map of a funnel, you're already doing UX. So mm. this is what I mean. So funnel landing page, which leads to the main, main quiz page, and then quiz end page. So this is, you know, it's it's a simple, it's quite a simple funnel. So this is what it is. Because also this company never sells to them getting an email is already a conversion because they always sell after a personal relationship has been established. And by that, I mean, telephone calls, that's okay. the way they are. So okay. that's, you know, that's what makes them special. So, but the real secret after you've done the, the map, what makes the, all the difference is uh, user flows, which for me was a new concept as a designer for print move to the web. So the journey that a user takes from the moment they get in touch, with your product is not something that I considered when I was a when I was a, a designer for print. So on the web, you really need to chart, predict, and direct so that the the journey that you use it will take so that you make it as smooth as possible. And this makes our job as designers when you get to actually designing so much easier. So this is just this is uh, the user flow for that map. And it, while it might look complicated, in fact, doing this is makes your life so much easier because I had the pages. I knew already what the pages were. So when I went to create the flow, you it makes you so I, I could just pull in the pages yeah. and it made me think, OK, wait a minute. So let's say that from the Facebook ad, they get to the funnel landing page. Hmm, maybe they want to take the quiz, but maybe they don't. So what happens if they don't want to take the quiz? So this is putting yourself in your user's shoes again and, and considering what they what they uh, can may not feel like doing and take everything into into consideration. Mm -hmm. So this is the best thing that you can do. So then once you've done this, when you've, so you've done this sitemap first and then you pull in the sitemap in the user flow, then what comes that next is is wireframes. And I'm sure that, but I, I don't ever take anything for granted. Let's say that, you know, wireframe is a layout with visual flow of crucial elements without the distraction of styling. Yeah. I don't know if you do them, Nathan. I do them very occasionally because it really depends on the on the project. And sometimes when you have to hand it off, you have to have them. But yeah. I, I used to Again, do them a lot, but now since the advent of the page builder, I kind of don't because it's almost the same job replicated in many ways. Absolutely. And then you also have an interactive prototype, which is yeah. always great. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I'm saying what I was saying earlier, UX uh, followed by UI. The reality is that you just it's much better to launch a lower profile version and then perfect it. That's what yeah. I that's what I recommend. So. Um, so back to our funnel. Um, to the quiz that we're talking about. So um, I'm still, you know, doing my best to think like Sharon. So there this she is, is what there, is Sharon, yeah. there she is. And yeah. she is, lo is looking so happy. And she's looking, you know, um, how to put it nicely, sort of like if she reassures me that I can do, I can probably do the, the Camino because she doesn't look like a you know bodybuilder or someone yes, who runs yes. 100 miles a day and she looks unbelievably happy so I think this photo is is brilliant and also the the button is big and bold and the thing is it's quite good that I'm sort of close to the to the target age because I make copy big mate you know my <laughs> yeah. headlines are big 
and the contrast is always <laughs> strong enough because I otherwise I can't see. So it makes me feel that I'm younger than this particular Sharon, but it makes me feel, oh, when I be there, I'll be you. And, you know, mm. it makes me think, yeah, maybe I can do it. So then the quiz itself, I'm really proud of, actually. And I have to thank publicly Mike Sale because he, because he's a friend from various Facebook groups and he's also target audience. So I, I asked him a lot of questions, but he uh, helped me a lot with uh, setting up the gravity forms for this. And he's been, you know, he was brilliant. Well, so he's watching this right quiz, now. So. Is he? Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you again. Mm. Great. So um, the quiz addresses all of Sharon's uh, fears and questions. And this is where copy is such an essential part of UX. By the way, on the Design for Geeks website, website designforgeeks.com, I've just published an article on the UX of copy by Andrea Zona, who's the uh, main the chief content creator at SiteGround. And please read it because it's it's really uh, brilliant stuff. Mm. Um, so copy is essential for UX. You need to be consistent. You need to have a tone of voice and so on. And um, this is a really good example of that. So after they get to the end of the of the quiz, they get to a an offer of a free list of what to pack on the Camino that Sharon will definitely find useful because we asked her basically, we asked all the users and this is what came up. Now, this particular client didn't want to be aggressive. So once you finish that, you can easily finish the quiz and not download the packing list. And actually this didn't work because very few people, a lot of people took the quiz because it's also, it's interesting and informative and it's good, but not that many people actually downloaded the freebie. So it's like, actually, you know what, not being aggressive hasn't worked. So we need to be a little more aggressive, which this client didn't like because, yeah, I know. But the thing is, I am, I'd be like that, be like, ooh, yeah. thank you for taking yeah. the quiz. Do you mind? Would you mind? Yes. And the thing is, it, it doesn't work. You know when we all say we hate pop-ups and every marketer says, oh, well, you know, yeah, well, they work. <laughs> like yeah. I say, now I say that I, I, I hate Facebook uh, bots, uh, chat bots, but every marketer says they absolutely work. And actually, this is where it's proven true. Because if you're not mm. a little bit, you're not terribly aggressive, but a little bit aggressive, then, you know, it, it's like it, it may not work. So this is what we did. So basically, we got the this up and running done already. You know, after the, the, the visual flow came the build straight away. And we were testing it immediately, you know. So yep. uh, that's what you do in real life. So test, uh, um, which was the, the design thinking phase, which is validation in, in UX. So you can also call it optimizing already. I mean, technically, validation is before you launch and optimizing. Uh, optimization is, is after you launch, where you look at improving your results via real usage data. You know, it's, it's not, you know, let's not be too, uh, what's it called? Uh, never mind. Anyway, so <laughs> usability testing, however, um, is is essential and it needs to be done at some point you can do it after you've launched but just as long as you prepare to make the changes and um, usability testing is something else that scares people off but it can really be done on a budget so if you do it on a, a shoestring and on deadline there are so many ways you can do it if you're the extroverted type you can enter a cafe and ask strangers i promise you can do that it's done your partner or your kids or your parents, uh, anyway, anyone who is not you, because also yep. let's not forget you, you suffer from proximity blindness when you've been on a project too much. Like, for instance, I have just spotted a typo, not you parents, your parents in the second bullet point. And this is a typical example of proximity blindness. So ask someone else to revise your slides as well as your um, uh, websites. And your friends, their parents, their kids, Facebook groups are also a really great way. And, and then online tools as well that I'll, I'll mention uh, later. But really, anyone, you can, there's a famous five second step test that you can do with anyone. You can just literally grab anybody who's near you and say, What does this website do? Five, you've got five seconds to answer, and they can mm. answer anything that comes to their mind. Mm. Um, so here's a quick list 
of online tools that you can use to carry out usability testing. Usertesting.com is super high budget, so probably not that, but there are many, many others. Um, and um, don't think that you need to like carry out thousands because you can address issues in as many as five with mm. after you know as many as five five tests. So, and this is the thing about UX, and this is the point that I'm sort of most keen to make: that UX is not a solution that's perfect straight out of the box. The whole point is precisely the optimization phase. So that's why methodologies such as Agile or Lean, so that go in sort of spurts, that which are called design sprints. So you mm -hmm. agree that you will do a certain chunk of the project and then you launch it and then you'll optimize it, which is a great way also of saving money because instead of doing a huge project all at once and then doing all the research all at once and then you launch the website and maybe it's a disaster, you do it in bits, basically. You sort of chunk up the project in m more manageable bits. But the most important thing is to get clients to understand that a website is meant to be optimized and then you're never going to know what people want until they actually use it. Because yeah. even all the user testing that, you know, you can do all the user testing that you want and it will still not give you what you will eventually really get when people the final users really, really do use mm -hmm. it. So you get you get a solution out, you look at the data, and then you go back and you make it better. And mm -hmm. I've embraced this to the point where I don't really want to work with clients anymore who don't agree to an ongoing optimization budget after the website is launched, because I oh, know, I, yeah. yeah, so that's what I mean. It's just, this is really, it's a further recurring revenue generator if you start embracing this process because it's it really there's no point to a website unless until especially a website that sells things obviously a brochure website is a different story so remember what we said about the design thinking process it's non-linear and the testing are optimized and optimize it phase is what you always get back to and go back to other, the other phases as well so in short back it set it right try again mm -hmm. fail again and fail better and this is the actual quote so uh yes in a nutshell this is uh this is what uh what uh, i mean by ux for everyone as you've seen it was done in with a small client i had no team uh, but myself and then i uh, hired external people for seo and and Google Ads, which we eventually did do. Um, mm -hmm. But in order to carry out the process, you don't really need anybody else. And you can actually do it in a day. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Picture bringing the bringing the knowledge that was great. The the thing that sort of speaks to me is the firstly the empathize step at the beginning. I really like the way you phrase that because it's too easy to, as you said, um, get bogged down in how it looks to you and what you want it to be like. Just and that's a, obviously an obvious stumbling block. And then I I like the little flow charts where you know you go back and also the notion of pitching to the client this is a this is an iterative approach it doesn't matter when we finish whatever the date of the first release is that's not the date that the website's finished because that date doesn't exist i think that's an, a really interesting uh, approach which i confess i've never really framed it in that sense i've always framed the ongoing relationship as more of a more of a um a, a way of preventing calamity shall we say you know i'll, I'll yeah, do backups exactly. and i'll you, do you know what i mean so i like yeah. i like this i think that's really good really really interesting and just you know spilling spilling loads of um authoritative information that's wonderful Great. Um, thank you very much yeah you're very welcome now i i guess unless you've got um, more slides that you want to show us i'm just going to quickly put something up on the screen which is uh, an offer that uh, we'll no doubt get to this in a moment but i would just put this in front of you to say that Peaches very kindly, I did on the video that I did about an hour ago, asking people to turn up to this, I did say that Peacher would, would put something forward for you guys. Now this is nice, I think this is nice. So Peaches just spent an hour talking generically to all of you about what it is that she does and how she's, you know, dissected sites in order to make them, make the job easy, easier to, to understand from the client's point of view and from the end user's point of view. What she's offering here is, 
when when she gets to the bit in a moment where she explains what her course is she's offering if you if you purchase that course today she's going to get on a call with you now i don't know exactly how peach is going to do that would be a skype or messenger or whatever but she's going to give you a 20 minute kind of dissection session where she goes and reviews a website project that you've got going on and uh, if you want to make use of that She's going to offer that for 48 hours, basically, until the end of Independence Day in the United States. That's so it. the 4th of July. Now, it is tied to this link. So either scribble it down somewhere. So it's wpbuilds.com forward slash link forward slash UX, the number for everyone. Uh, or you can just click on the buy now button yeah. and then book. I was going to ask, I hope that works. <laughs> yeah, it does work. It does work. It does. It does. He said, I'm going to try it and see if it works. Uh, yes. because, uh, it, I'm sure it does. I'm pretty sure. I, I'm pretty careful uh, when I test these things. So I'm going to I'm going to um, put my thumb in the air I'm and say, yeah, it. that's going to work. Yeah, it's working. Um, so that's just a nice, kind offer. Obviously, you don't need to redeem it through that. If you want to listen to Peter talking about her course and you want to wait for more than 48 hours, so be it. Very good. But uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes on the call with Peter, I think it's probably worth uh, getting in so, early. Yes, so the price is actually just to specify, this is a pre-sale price, so um, the course is being built. The price will not change. What you don't get anymore after the 4th of July is the one-on-one -on -one review session, but the sure. price will stay the same until the 28th of July because it's a pre-sale because I'm building it and you're basically, um, you know, being patient while I while I while I build it, mm -hmm. and uh, so what's in the UX for Everyone course is the process that I described very quickly because also I realised that I was sort of taking too long, so I didn't want to bore you with too much. Um, but um, it's a process that I described, but in much more detail and going especially into the techniques and how to create the users' personas and so on. One thing that I really want to clarify is that. This is all meant to make your processes faster, not slower. I'll repeat it. UX makes things faster, not slower. Because I think that's a big thing that people think, oh, my God, if I do all this, it's just going to take ages. It's not. First of all, there are ways of doing it all in a day, and I mean it. But in the second place, once you've done this, and this is something that we were saying with Paul, Lacey's, Paul Lacey and his partner, Peter, Vesolowski, who've been yeah. my guests on Designers for Geeks various times. And, and Peter is a pure UXer who's working in Nissan. So, you know, he really knows what he's talking about. And what he says is that the design process is um, sped, speeded up, sped up. How do I say it? You, yeah. you sped up, perfect. Um, immensely by carrying out all the research. And I know it sounds like, you know, sort of, fancy and grand and you know who use personas but actually it's really not that difficult and it will make things so much easier once you know who you're talking to i mean it happened to me with the design for geeks project because i'd always wanted to teach design i know that i love doing it but i just didn't know who i was doing it for and the minute it became clear clear to me oh my god my life was so easy it's basically what they say about finding your niche but it goes you know this is sort of granular and specific to your own clients. And mm. I promise you that they never, they haven't done it this way and they will be so thankful and so kind of like flabbergasted that it can be made so much easier for them. Um, so, uh, yes. We've got a couple of questions. Firstly, um, Cindy, I'm going to say Cindy, I think Fleming Alton, or Alton, sorry. Um, I've, I've put the little link up again if you want to see it. If you if you don't dismiss it, it I think it'll just stay on the page. Uh, but it's wpbuilds.com forward slash link forward slash UX for everyone. That's good. I think she's got that now. And a couple of questions. Uh, Mike Sale, who obviously you know, but um, perhaps hasn't seen yeah. the inside, inside guts of this course, asked the following question. He said, uh, I can be a little dense, so if you're self-deprecating, Mike, um, <laughs> will the course break things down for me in a way I can use a defined process and easily go back to the content for reference? So do you want me to read that again? Um, will the course break things down for me in a way that I can use a defined process and easily go back to the content for reference? Absolutely. So that's the main point. So if you take, when, once you take the course, 
what you get is a framework, a blueprint that you can use both for your own process and for your clients. And you can actually upsell it to your clients as well as, as, a, as an extra kind of process. You know, when people say the difference, you know, between the Wix and WordPress or, mm -hmm. you know, between us and someone who designs a Wix, this is it. And yes, you would get that, um, Mike. So I'm just looking for um, the course outline, which I wrote. So it should be easy for me to find it, wouldn't it? Um, uh, if you so click on the link on the webinar, it'll get you to the, the sort of landing page, which is um, which is designforgeeks.com. Actually, it's probably yeah. too difficult for me to. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put the I'll put the little offer up again. Shall we? Shall we have our faces again? Because uh, at oh, the yeah, moment it's just try again, again, fell again. Here I am. So it'd be Here nice am. to. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be there in a second as soon as I found. The it's actual... the little button third from the left, I, I believe. It looks a little bit like a camera. Um, and yes, that will mean that you'll yeah, get to I'll see, do see that in it. I'll lovely do that faces in faces again. Ah, uh, yes. Well, you're here now. You're there. They're yes. only seeing you for now. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, Poor people. They're still... Uh, I'm very appreciative. Thank you so much to everybody who's made the time to come on. What, is, I, what I firmly good. believe is that you've been dropped a ton of value. You know, easy for me to say those kind of things, but I, I think Peacher basically talked for well over an hour. We see you. There you are. Peacher talked for well over an so hour, I, and, uh, and it was it zero of, sale. Thank you. Uh, that's what I really wanted. How do we turn the slides off? Can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. Let me just remove those. There you go. Now, if you want to share your screen for some reason, then we can do that as well. You just click on the screen button at the top and probably best to pick uh, your Mac, entire Mac monitor, even if that means then you have to minimize this webinar yeah. um, to get to yeah. what you want. Sorry, for. I'm still I'm still looking somewhere else, which is not what I wanted to do. But again, it's live, isn't it? It is live, so, yeah. Uh, let me it's remind nice. you, whilst Peter tries to figure out how the, this webinar platform works, which is a little bit counterintuitive, <laughs> if you've got any questions, then um, please put them in the q and I think we've probably got about 10 more minutes in us, and then after that, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call this a day. But any more questions, please put them in there. Um, Mike has actually asked another question. I don't know, Peter, if you're ready to oh, answer another. Yeah, he said... I can definitely answer. Yeah. Okay, he says, do you help us apply these phases? So I presume he's talking about the, you know, the five phases or your reduced three phases. See, I was listening. Um, do you help us apply these phases to our own sites? Um, I presume that means in the course or maybe on the 20 minute call. Uh, what do you mean supply the faces to the I don't I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I presume what he's saying is, you know, in, in the case of the webinar, you you took a you took apart the Santiago de Compostela um website. I'm wondering if he's thinking yeah. does can you take can you take you know his own website and pull it to pieces in that way? I suppose so. Um I, I um uh yeah maybe yeah yeah i'm i just I, i'm not entirely sure i still understand it but i would say yes the face so basically uh sorry if i'm fluffing about it's a little okay. bit but yes the whole point is that uh the whole point is the process that's what the course does it's 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 outlines um it gives you a process to follow and uh so that there are no sort of ifs or buts and that you but I don't I, actually. I'm going to shut up because I'm not sure that I'm answering the question. Mike, well, I'll tell you what. If you, again. Mike, if you obviously, if you know, he's actually written up a follow-up question. I don't know if this helps. He says uh, it was in the context of those phases in the diagram. Uh, what I'm going to say, Mike, is okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I just what I'm going to do is I am going to uh, share my screen with the. Um, with the, the uh, modules for the course, yeah. Okay. So in that, so that's going to be clearer because um, they're actually not yet in the on the sales page. So I'm just um, going to. Will it work? Yeah, this I'm is the question. We're working live. Um, we're working live. He actually, yeah. he has actually so, said his question is now answered. But nevertheless, I think it would be quite illustrative for the rest of us. So yeah, and the thing is, so I can. Um, I think it's easier if you, I can just, I could read them, but I think it's easier for everybody if I actually show them to you at the same yeah. time. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna share my screen, start sharing screen, uh, my entire screen. 
That'll do it. And then That'll just make it. sure to get to get this webinar uh, Chrome screen out of the way. Can't see anything coming so, through yet. We'll, share, we'll give you a call. Yeah. yeah. So here I you go. I saw that. Thanks, Mike. So, by the way, I'll get to that. So this is. Can you see that? Module one. Uh, it says UX. yes. I can see something which looks potentially like a Chrome page. Uh, yes. In other words, yes, I can. Can you read? Yeah. Okay. Great. So okay. Um, the uh, again, this uh, is subject to change because I've committed to uh, to for the first uh, module to be out by the end of the month or the beginning of August. But it's subject to change because it probably means that I will add more. Like for instance, there isn't right now in the um, it is a specific what. Um, lesson on the UX of copy, but there will be. So module one is intro to UX. So it goes into a little bit more detail because um, it's really important to quite grasp what makes UX and also how to sell UX to clients. And each module has resources that you can download and use and um, brand. They will be white labeled and they will be in a number of, of uh, formats, probably Google Docs or InDesign and InDesign so that you can um, use your own brand for them if, you know, things like uh, user persona interviews and things like that, then you can reuse them. Then module two is the human-centered design bit, so which is about, uh, about empathy and how it sort of drips into accessibility and also something that I am endlessly fascinated by. Some of you have uh, seen my talk about uh, Gestalt psychology, and I sort of recently uh, wandered off into vis visual perception and memory and the basics of use of behavior, because I'm endlessly fascinated by that. And there was, a, I did a talk on that like, this year uh, that was really long, because it was a keynote speech, it was like an hour and a half, it's basically a workshop, and it's just endlessly fascinating, and it really is about uh, UX as well, and also emotions and how they drive behavior, because that, and again, this is where I, all, I it becomes clear how the various uh, techniques overlap and how the various disciplines overlap, because this is marketing, really. So if you improve the UX, uh, the UX, you also improve the, the marketing. And then usability and uh, resources downloads. And I've put usability in this bit, because I think it's about human-centered design mostly. Then the process again, and sort of having an, an, an overview of what the process is, as well as the structural parts of a UX project. This is something, you know, strategy, scope, structure, skeleton, and surface. I won't go deeply into it, because it's more typically what big budget projects do, but you do need to know, because it's a way of uh, it's just knowing the components of a digital project, really. So it's important to know. And then going to uh, the faces again, which then each face gets its own module. So this is where you really get the process and you get the blueprint blueprint of the process. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so that this is where, you know, that's I think that's what my question was, because I think it's super important that, this is not, I mean, I like theory as well. I like to understand you do. how things work. You do like theory. I really do. I love it. Yeah. But I also am very much aware that I need to find out how things work. So I'm a mixture of the two. So when I take a course, I, I want to know, but at the same time, I do need to know how to make it work as quickly as possible because we're all busy and we just need to make it work. So this is what the course is is uh, is going to, to, to give you. Yeah. So it will, we have you know, Yes. Sorry, sorry. Um, actually, Mike has said that that was that was a nice, uh, helpful explanation. Presumably, the information that you're currently showing on that page, uh, which is I don't know, like a, a word document or something like that, that will go onto the sales page at some point. Or, of course, you can just watch the playback yeah. that you're going to get and scroll to the I don't it know, will go. To, scroll to like one hour and uh, eighteen minutes or something. You'll find it right. No, now. it you won't be needed. It it's going. It's going on the sales page, okay. if not today, because I'm in Siena and there's a Palio host race, but it will go <sighs> tomorrow. So. Yeah, yeah. One last but question it, before we before we have to knock it on the head is Vic has asked, what level of design experience is this course appropriate for? See, this is a really good question because honestly, 
I think that if you had no design experience, you could take this course because I don't really go much into the UI. I will go into the UI a little bit, but at the end, but not much. So if by uh, design experience, you mean the ability to design an interface, it doesn't, it gets to it. And I think I will throw in a bonus on that, so on sort of basic design principles, but this is about the process. It's not about uh, the detail of the design. And to, this is sort of the crux of the matter for me because I've always wanted to do a typography course or a course on color, but I didn't mm. in the end because I think it's pointless. If we design digital products, we need to get the UX process first. Yeah. Once you've, get, you've got this, then you get to the UI. So the, a proper UI course is coming after this, but you need to do the UX first. And another thing that I want to say again is that although this looks like a huge kind of, you know, it's, it's a big course, it's not a small course, but the aim of the course is just to make things as, uh, not fast is the wrong word, but as, as easy as possible to actually smooth out the process and create a process that ma makes things much quicker for you to, mm -hmm. to, to, to do and implement. And, and it's the way, it's the way it ends up working in the end. This has been great. I love talking to you, primarily because you are a source of amazing knowledge sharing. that I simply don't have. Uh, you know, I genuinely don't have this expertise at all. Um, but also the ton of value that you give. Um, you know, we had like an hour, well over an hour before we got to the um, to the court at the end. And I appreciate I appreciate you taking the subject in that way um, rather than pitching right from the beginning. I think that's an important way of doing these things. Um, Thank Talk you Hill very says, much. Thing, um, me and thanks uh, Peacher for the great run through that's brilliant um, sadly I would love to spend the rest of the day chatting with you lot but um, I I'm going to have to go very very soon I know so, I know say, click on the link it's wpbuilds.com forward slash link forward slash forward slash ux the number for everyone or click I will when I end this webinar you'll go to that page anyway but uh, yeah, massive thanks to Peacher. I appreciate all of you. Thank you so much for all, all of you. Thank you, thank you very much. The line. And, um, and Peacher, I'll, I'll hook up with you in about 10 minutes from now, if that's all right. Um, thanks to both of you. That was very interesting, says Roger. Uh, I will, says Will. Thanks, says Guy. So oh, Will like, was big, here. So big, great. big round of applause for Peacher. Thank so, you very you much indeed. Being so patient we need that, don't we? We're in these webinar platforms, we need like a clap. You need a thing that you can do when you want to clap. Oh, Vic's found a thumbs up. Where was that, Vic? <laughs> Where did you get? Oh, look, there is. I can do that too. Yeah, me as well. Great. Um, I'm going to end it and say enjoy the rest of your Tuesday, and we'll speak to you all Thank soon. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Stop the recording first. That's probably the, the main thing I need to do. That is now.